this is a, a story that I enjoy. One of the things that's very misunderstood in our industry is the idea of rates. And this is just a basic piece of everything we do. We talked about economic rates in the principles. And so I want to go over this just to give you something that you can share with your clients, to give you something to help you understand the way rates work. People typically try to add and subtract rates and things. That's the way rates work. And it is drastically different from that. So one of the things that I like to use is a story. I like to go back in time a little bit, look at a history lesson, and understand how banks make money. And that's really what we're talking about. So how does a bank make money? Leverage. By leverage, right? They don't really make anything, do they? No, but it's a spread. How does a retail business that sells widgets make money? By leverage, right? It's the same... It's, it's really the same principle. It's just the difference between marking up money and marking up things, right? So it's, it's the same idea. So let's look at how this works. Um, so those of you that are around and understood finance back in the 80s, what was the economic environment like from the standpoint of interest rates, bank rates? Very high, right? CD rates were, they actually jumped above 10%. They didn't stay there. But it's interesting. We hadn't seen that before in history. And all of a sudden, everybody decided that CD rates were going to be 9% from now on. There were people that took early retirement packages from good jobs because of the amount of money they had sitting in the bank at 9%, because that was going to last forever, even though we'd never seen it before. Life insurance companies made knee-jerk reactions and introduced products to try to compete with the bank because of something they had never seen before. It's kind of into that idea of um, the knee-jerk reaction, the, the scarcity mentality, right? So there were lots of things that happened, and we saw rates at 9%. Now, at the same time, we saw consumer debt running about 15%. All right? So if you think about the way the banks make money, they've got a cost. They're having to pay their depositors of 9% and they're getting 15. Most people say, yeah, the bank's entitled to 6%. That's the difference between 9 and 15, right? Kind of makes sense. What people don't do, which is to the advantage of the financial industry, is break it down into actual dollars so we can see what's happening. So let's do that. So let's say that Kim deposits $100 in the bank when they're paying 9%. How much is the bank going to have to pay in rent to rent Kim's money for a year. How much? Nine dollars, right? Nine percent of a hundred. So they're going to pay Kim nine dollars. Now, if I come along and I need a hundred dollars, is the bank going to loan me their money or are they going to sublet Kim's money to me? They're going to sublet Kim's money to me, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll look at why that is in just a minute. So at a 15% rate, how much am I going to have to pay for the privilege of renting Kim's money for a year? $15. In one year, or per year, is not a 6% rate of return. It's a 66.67% rate of return. If I can buy hammers, I have a hardware store, and I can buy hammers for $9 and sell them for $15, do I call that a 6% markup? No, it is a 66.67% markup. And the fact that banks do it with money, there's no difference. It's the same thing. They're just marking up money. Okay, so let's look at why they don't use their own money. So just get me another one, just temporarily, if you would. All right, so... If the bank, when I came in and I needed money, if the bank put their money in the deal, how much money would they have to invest? $100, right? That would be their cost. So they'd have to put 100 in and they'd get 115 back in a year, which would be only 15%. So through the power of leverages, leverage, through the power of OPM, other people's money, they were able to turn what would have been 15% into 66.67. With me so far? Okay, now, let's go into the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s. What happened to interest rates? 
<laughs> they fell to nothing, right? We had the SNL debacle. <laughs> yeah, right? Almost overnight, we saw CD reach, rates drop to three. And it's interesting how that happened. So Alan Greenspan was head of the Federal Reserve. And what's also interesting is Alan Greenspan was an Austrian in his economic thought. That's where his principles were. But he gave in on his principles. He violated his principles and started manipulating interest rates. What was the result of that? And this is the way he passed it off. He said, look, if we can artificially change the interest rates, we can lower them, which will create consumer spending, which will bail the banks out. Seemed logical, even though it was against what it was supposed to be, because interest rates should be the buffer of any economy. Think about this. When money is tight, there's not a lot of money. Where should interest rates be? High, right? When there's plenty of money laying around and nobody needs it, where should interest rates be? Low. That should not be something that gets manipulated. It should just automatically, with supply and demand, happen. But we got into a scenario of manipulating interest rates. And we, what do you think happened to the people that took the early retirement packages under the 9% scenario when all of a sudden those CD rates are earning 3 instead of 9? That's right. They learned, learned a new phrase, right? Welcome to Walmart. <laughs> Had to pick up another job. Go back to work. Probably not at the same level that they left, right? Um, one of those black swan events. Okay, so we saw CD rates go to three, and what the banks did was they kept the spread that they were using at these other rates of 6%. So what does that mean? How much were they loaning money at? What was the rate? Nine, right? All right, so they're paying $3 per hundred, and they're loaning it out at $9 per hundred. It's the same 6% spread. It's got to be the same 66.67, right? Per year is now 200%. What's interesting is this, when they dropped interest rates, the banks were bailed out in a matter of months. Not for the reason that Alan Greenspan said, and that was consumer spending, but because simple financial mathematics. If we can lower the cost, keep the spread the same, all of a sudden our rate of return goes to 200%. You can look at this and say, oh, this is impossible. This takes a paradigm shift, and it's going to take that paradigm shift for your clients too. So let's think about this and how this could possibly be. So if we look at pure dollars in the first transaction, how much money was made? $6. $6. Pool of money that they had to invest was limited at nine dollars. How many transactions on that second one could they do? And how much do they make on each transaction? No, in dollars. Six dollars, right? So here with nine dollars, they get six dollars. Over there for nine dollars, they get eighteen dollars, or three times as much for the same investment, right? Guess what 3 times 66.67 is? 200. Questions on that? And what does that mean? Banks are bad? Well, maybe. But that's really not the point. The point is, if we can get our head around this and understand what's going on, maybe we can play the role of the bank. What if we could do this instead? Maybe not at this level, because... You know, with the fractional reserve system, um, if we did it, it'd be illegal, even though they're able to get away with it, right? But, but let's look at it a smaller piece. What if, as an example, I had a child or grandchild that had taken on some debt while they were going through college? Is that a possibility? What's the rate going to be on that debt on credit card for a non-income earning college student? 23, 4%, somewhere along in there? Would it be beneficial for that child or grandchild if you bought that debt from them and charged them 10% instead of the 23 or 24 they're paying? Be huge, wouldn't it? Especially with what we understand on the way interest rates work. What if you had a source of money and it was gonna cost you 8%? 
Well, you can look at that and say, well, eight to 10, that's only two points. Well, it's, that's, that's no good. It's not the way interest rates work. Let's put it in here. Eight to 10 per year is a 25% rate of return for you. And what? And the kids' estate. And the kids' estate. What would happen? Is there any risk in that transaction? Yeah, the kid might not pay, right? So how do you fix that and make it fair to the other siblings or whatever else? Guess what? Until that debt's paid off, it comes off the inheritance. That chunk just keeps growing, and that portion is going to be separated. Okay? So if we can understand that small differences, when we can use them in our favor and leverage those differences, can have a huge impact. And so it's very easy for a client to, to look at rates and get caught up in that and say, well, if I go from 4% to 5%, that's only 1%. Why would I, why would I go to the trouble for 1%? No, 4% to 5% is a 25% rate of return. That's huge. And if we look at this, out over time, and I think maybe this helps, just real quick, Kim, if you'll get me a future value calculator, and we can use the eight and 10, that's the same relationship. So let's put in $100,000 at 8% for 30 years. And then let's put in, give me another one, and put in $100,000 at 10% for 30 years. Is that a 2% difference? Oh. Okay, we need to understand how interest rates work. That doesn't need to drive every decision we make, but we need to keep things in line. And if we can understand that and the principles behind it, then we can easily make decisions. So let me ask you this. If you had an investment opportunity and you could find money at 4%, and this investment was gonna earn three, would that be a good decision? What about the other way around? What if we could find money at three and be able to earn four? So we need to under start understanding how interest rates work. And when we extend that out, we start to understand the fallacies and some of the stuff that we're being told that's easy to sell. One of the things that we've been putting out there is, the lie is easier to tell than the truth is to explain. Okay, the lie is always a one-liner. But to explain the truth, you have to give a whole paragraph or a whole page. So your job is in that education process is not as easy as it is for the lie to spread. So when, when somebody says something along the lines of, you're gonna pay more cumulative interest on a 15 year, on a 30 year mortgage than you are on a 15 year mortgage. That is absolute fact. But that does not mean that the 30 year mortgage cost more than the 15. Because if we understand the way rates work, and I can stretch that out, why in the world would I take, based on what we know here, 5% potential dollars to pay down deductible debt that maybe cost me at three, three and a half percent? Wouldn't I be better off having the debt at three and a half while I'm earning 5% on the money instead? Yet people get caught up on the wrong thing. They make decisions out of scarcity, they see the amount of interest cumulative over time, and they lose the point of what's really happening to them. And so we've gotta keep that in focus and understand what's going on. Because of the size of debt, we literally, and I'm sure some of you do too, have clients that have $15,000, $20,000 worth of 18% credit card debt that they're letting ride because they've got half a million dollars worth of debt on their house that's costing them a net 3%. And they're doubling up on the house payment and letting 18% debt ride because of the difference between $500,000 of debt and $20,000 or $18,000 of debt or whatever the credit card debt is, they're missing the point. It's not the amount of money that's there, it's what it's costing them to finance it. Make sense?